Well, and welcome to yet another podcast of Light Beer, Dark Money. I'm the Light Beer Man, Chris Clements. And unfortunately, my compatriot, Sean Noble, is a little bit indisposed today. All right. Um, but however, we have a great guest with us today, Major General Mick McGuire, candidate for U.S. Senate. Thank you, Chris. And great I just to wanna, be here. Great to have you. And I just want to remind everybody, this podcast is about faith, freedom, and free enterprise. And our goal here is to agree on something you even bet. if we don't agree on i everything. can agree on all three of those things and hopefully you can find us on all the great social media platforms including facebook twitter linkedin youtube and it's streaming everywhere now because this is our second episode recording at the great mayor of of radio dave pratt live at Star World Ride Networks. So you're, you're, you're our first guest. Well, thank you. It's a new, great studio. In our, new, in our new digs. You got a great setup here. Well, thank you for being here. Thank you for agreeing to come on. Yeah, thanks for having me. So the, the obvious question, you know, just as, as we lead off, um, you're running for the United States Senate. I am. After serving uh, your country um, for, for many years, over 30 years. Yeah, and 34 years, 34 nearly years. 34 years commissioned and four years of cadet at the academy, almost yeah. 38 in total. And, and so what, what, what has possessed you to, first of all, tell us a little about your background. Sure, sure. And then also what, what's possessing you to want to run for the United States Senate? I don't know if you saw the news today, but the Senate, United States Senate today, it's, it's a tough day to be a Democrat. They're, things are melting down. Yeah, I, they, I, I don't know if we're going to shut the government down or not, but... We can talk about that. I, I experienced the longest government shutdown three weeks after Governor Brewer appointed me. So I've been on the other side of that. But yeah, uh, yeah, who am I? I? I tell people in my launch video that after 34 years of military service uh, as a commissioned officer, the final eight, nearly eight years as the commanding general of 8,300 great soldiers, airmen, and civilians in all 15 counties in this great state, I chose to retire on April 10th. Um, I'm a fourth generation Arizonan. Uh, my my great grandfather on my dad's side uh, was the first one here. Was a roundhouse scheduler for the Southern Pacific Railroad. Mm. Uh, his other great his other grandfather, my paternal great grandfather on that side, was the second one here, and he was a retired colonel from the U.S. Army, and was part of the medical corps and a surgeon. I'm not sure what surgeons did in the Spanish American War and uh, World War One, but that's what he did. And, he retired and was one of the first uh, physicians out in Pima County, down in Tucson. And then on my mom's side of the family, they came here in 1952 when her dad was a chief mechanic for um, Border Patrol for the Arizona sector. He had been moved from the northern border up in North Dakota. And uh, my mom and dad graduated Tucson High, went to U of A. And when they graduated U of A, my father was commissioned in the Navy. Hmm. And so I was born out on the West Coast. He left the Navy and... Uh, 1968, and I've been uh, was raised out there. Started his businesses out there, but I tell people, Chris, I you know we had season tickets to U of A football games when I was a little kid. We would come out from California. All my extended family was out here in Arizona. So I met my wife Debbie. She's been with me 33 years. Uh, I met her in high school, actually in ninth grade out in California, and I went off to the Air Force Academy. She went to USC. When I finished up uh, 14 years of active service, flew as an F-16 pilot uh, right out of the academy, was an F-16 guy, flew in the Gulf, deployed a couple subsequent times as an operational F-16 pilot after that, uh, left the active Can service. Can I just interrupt you just really quick because this is an amazing s story. If memory serves, uh, you also attended and was, I believe, an instructor at Top Gun. For, I went to, that's right, I went to the fighter weapons school. That was for right the after. the Air Force. Through the Air Force, yeah. Which is, which is different than for it's the Navy. It's different than the Navy, correct. But our fighter weapons school was up at Nellis. I did that yeah. after my first Arizona assignment. I was an instructor out at Luke and lived in Northwest Valley out in Arrowhead Ranch from mm -hmm. 92 to 96. And I went here in the, in the winter of uh, December of 95, went up to Nellis, completed uh, weapons school, and then went to Isleson, Alaska, that was my last active assignment. And uh, we had three daughters at that time. The youngest, uh, you know her, uh, Maggie, she's a junior now. Baylor, she's the youngest of our three kids. Yeah, we, uh, have, we have a, I mean, full disclosure, we have a little bit of a history. Our, 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 our daughter, my oldest to daughter, your youngest daughter, went to preschool. They, they did. They did. Went to, they, small world in Arizona. 
And so uh, we talked about it. My brother and his wife were down there, extended family in, in uh, Tucson, and we, I left the active service, and I was a full-time F-16 instructor for nearly 13 years down in Tucson. And in 2013, Governor Brewer uh, asked me to come up to the state headquarters to be the commanding general of the Guard and the state emergency manager. And uh, when Governor Ducey was elected, uh, he reappointed me. So I was already state Senate confirmed, stayed in that position. And, and uh, that's, that's who I am. That's how I got here. And uh, live still up here in Phoenix, retired April 10th after nearly 34 years. And, and you and I are unicorns in, in, in that regard and that, that we're generational Arizonans, which is a, a rarity, right. especially nowadays when you have flocks of people from California and Illinois uh, come yeah, to you, you know, state. it's helped inform this campaign. You asked about why I would do this. And I tell this story on the trail. The last straw is no more heavy than the rest. The name of your show is Faith, Freedom, Free Enterprise. You know, I my mantra as a as an individual, as a commander, just in life is this uh, faith, family, duty paradigm. And I would mm. tell soldiers and airmen that, that you got to have the first two in order to do your duty. And I served for 34 years taking an oath to protect and defend the Constitution. And on January 8th of this year, I wasn't on a call with General Milley about China, but there's a lot of churn about that call. But I was on a call with the Joint Chiefs of Staff and the Acting Secretary of Defense. And they asked us to bring 6% of the National Guard to D.C. And I asked them, had uh, President Trump invoked the Insurrection Act? The answer was no. I asked them if he had declared an emergency. Uh, that superseded the public health emergency for civil unrest or riot? The answer was no. I asked him if they had assigned a domestic terrorist label to the group mm. uh, for a unique code of law that was af passed after 9-11. They said no. Well, then I, and I said, well, then I'm not going. You know, you, you talked about 83 going to the Air Force Academy. First thing we learned as young officers is we follow legal, moral, ethical orders. But if what you're asking me to do isn't legal, I don't get paid to judge the morality or efficacy. And I went home and talked to my wife. We, I didn't know exactly what, it, when and how and where I might retire, but I told her, I said, you know, we just saw Georgia. Uh, we lost two seats there, 50-50 Senate. Um, George Washington reminded us tyranny of the majority is far worse than tyranny of the individual. And uh, I'm going to jump in this Senate race. And she said, all right. And I, as I tell people in that launch video, it's same oath of office, different, different mission, right? U.S. senators take a same oath to protect and defend the Constitution as every sworn commissioned military officer. And uh, they got to first understand that their loyalty is to the Constitution and to the country over any partisan or special interest. Uh, and so it's been resonating well, Chris. I've been out in the grassroots and every place I go, they understand what I'm talking about. So that's why I'm in it. And I, I tell them, I've had a lot of people say, well, when are you going to become a rhino or when are you going to sell out to special interests? It, it happens everywhere. Sure. And I tell them, um, well, I mean, there's there's a reason for that. I mean, there's there's a, a segment of the electorate, uh, electorate specifically on 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 the Republican side, the conservative side. Uh, people with sound conservative beliefs feel that they've been sold out time well, and time again. They feel betrayed. They feel and, betrayed. Um, and, and that that explains if, if if people have not really really studied the sure. matter, the rise of Trump, the and, yeah. and the rise of. And, and I understand their reaction. The I told them. I tell them this. I will not live a life less fulfilled if I'm not a U.S. senator. Sure. And I mean that. But I will feel derelict in my duty if I watch the republic come apart at the seams. I was at a class at Harvard in twenty. I don't know, 15, I think. And mm -hmm. the instructor asked me, you know, a big group, this, you know, read the books, go there for a couple weeks kind of thing. And they asked, you know, what's the greatest threat to the Republic? And somebody said China or Russia. And I looked at them and said, the greatest threat to the Republic is the Republic. Maybe Franklin told us that. Yeah. So um, I think it still exists today. And I just, I'm, you know, when people ask, well, what do you mean? It's partisan and... It doesn't mean there aren't great people in this great state. There are great people everywhere in this state. This state is a bunch of cotton farmers and cattle growers and copper miners. That's what yeah. we are. Uh, and they may have different religious beliefs, political proclivities, and, and the rest. But the, the, the left is on the march for total control.
if, if, if you don't believe that tyranny of the majority is a real thing, you haven't traveled to the places in the world I've been. Sure. Well, I mean, and, and, and that goes to another, another point that you made in your introductory video and, and when you announced your candidacy, that you were going to visit all the counties yeah. of, of Arizona. And you, and you were going to speak to as many people as you could. Now, you have other candidates out there that I'm, I'm not going to get into naming names who really are spending a tremendous amount of money trying to get their name out there. But they really haven't done a lot of, a lot of visiting of the electorate, per right. se. Right. And um, so tell us a little bit about the, how, what informed your philosophy on that, number one. And number two, how's that going? What are you hearing? Well, what informed my philo philosophy on it is really my experience as the state emergency manager. Right when the COVID thing touched off, we had, you know, 15 county emergency managers. I was a state emergency manager and 22 recognized tribal entities. And within the first week, I said, I want to get a weekly call with all 37 of them so that they have a direct line to me because my job was not to um, lead or make tactical decisions at the local level. It was to help them fill gaps for food, ice, water, and medical supplies, mm -hmm. that they were better situated than I to know what they needed in Yavapai County or Cochise County or Navajo County than me. Well, I think the same thing is true about the election. I, I feel strongly that there is a, a sector of the rural counties that feel forgotten. The rural areas can make it just fine without the urban areas, but the urban areas have to have the rural counties. And so while they represent only one sixth of the vote, I have, have told everybody, my campaign team, the whole, the whole group, that I'm going to spend from now through the end of January of next year in the 13 rural counties. It's not that I don't love the people in Maricopa and Pima County, but the 13 rural counties are going to be charter members of the 2 million man and woman army we're raising that's going to wear T-shirts that say, I pick Mac. That's, that's who the charter members are. Doesn't mean that we're not going to take that five-sixths of the vote that comes from Maricopa and Pima County but we're going to build on that foundation of those rural counties. And it's been great. They, they're fired up. We're getting 50 people in a rural county at a meeting for lunch. It's unbelievable. And what are you hearing? Like, what, what sort of issues are they bringing up? What's, what, what? So, so in the rural counties, are, it's, it, you know, depending on where you're at, it's very, very interesting because you have, you have mining interests. You have, uh, obviously, American, uh, you know, um, Native American interests. Mm -hmm. You've got you've got uh, old old areas that were that were used to be timber interests. You have, if, if there's all these different types of economic interests within those within those rural counties, in addition to agriculture, and and many of those counties were for many many decades were hardcore Democrats, right? You know, and that has shifted over the past, I would say, thirty years. Yeah. So. Here's what I'm hearing uh, in the rural counties. They, like you and I, are worried about security first and foremost. Border security is a huge issue. I tell people in Arizona, border security is human security. It's much more than national security for us. You know, we talked about our long Arizona roots. I can remember 1975, my grandfather and my parents and I heading down to the cavern, crossing the border in Nogales, having dinner and coming back to Zula's and having the best apple pie in the state. The standard routine. Yeah. You can't do that anymore. Not because those aren't great places to visit, but because the amount of time it takes you to make normal traffic across the border has been inhibited by the amount of lawless activity that's occurring in places where we haven't secured the border. These are linked problems. If you have to divert resources to interdict human traffickers, drug smugglers, and all of the other illicit activities that's happening in open areas of the border, you pull resources away from the folks that can get normal commerce and normal traffic through the border. And it's affecting clearly our neighbors in Mexico more than us. But lawless behavior begets more lawless behavior. And violence rises. And the traditional rotational work that we had seen in the state is becoming more and more challenging for everybody. And it affects especially our rural communities. You know, the other big issue in the rural communities, as you had mentioned, is water. I mean, sure. it, uh, there's no county you can go to outside Pima and Maricopa that doesn't talk about the water rights. 
Colorado River rights, underground water rights, navigable water rights, tribal versus uh, county water rights. It, it's, it's a complex problem, and I tell people I'm learning. But I also tell them you do not want the federal government to use the 2,000-mile screwdriver to fix their problem. The federal government is the worst point-of-service industry known to man. The only thing the federal government is good at is putting warheads on foreheads. That's <laughs> it. They, there is no other duty they're good at. Yeah. I mean, I don't think anybody disagrees with that. Well, you mentioned I mean, the border, obviously, is the top of mind for everyone to see what's going on in, 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 in Texas. But we haven't, we haven't seen you know, as much here recently. And I think that has largely to do with a lot of your efforts over the last, I would say, you know, many years, the governor's efforts, uh, approaching the board with a realistic, you know, viewpoint. Yeah. Uh, I have a friend who's, who's border patrol and I used to ask him, you know, why, why are we being more successful in the U, the Yuma sector, you know, Arizona sector versus the Texas sector? And he said, it's all about leadership. It's all yeah. about, it's all, I mean, for lack of a better term, it's all about seeing what's coming and, and, and planning for that. Is that, do you think that's a viable? Assessment? I think it's, a, if you go back to 2006, when the guard first surged nearly 2,600 in this state to the border, our real purpose for that engagement was to help synchronize this new form agency, Department of Homeland Security, to figure out how to synchronize Border Patrol, Customs and Immigration, ICE, HSI, CBP Air and Marine, just, you know, kind of do kind of a teach and train and help about how we operate logistics, sustainment, and operations in a combat theater. Take some of that military experience and then use many of our uh, guardsmen out to man remote sites, which we subsequently have now replaced today with remote camera systems and the rest. So go forward, you know, twice under Obama, we put uh, uh, guardsmen to surge folks to the border, surge badges to the border. And under President Trump, he authorized up to a thousand in Arizona. Mm. Uh, and so the numbers have decreased, but the issue that we continue to face, and I tell people is this, if you have a completely open border, you have real enforcement problems. It stretches your manpower, your resources, and that's why building the wall is the first step. But I tell people as a military guy, any physical barrier you obstruct or, or you build that you don't properly surveil and enforce is a waste of money. So it's a two-part problem. You yeah. have to build the wall, then you have to use proper synchronization of your resources to surveil it, and then have the number, right number of people to enforce it. And... Um, it's become such a fractious issue, I think, that at this point you have to bifurcate the immigration policy from border security. Border security is an inviolate requirement for a sovereign country. How we handle the flood is a different issue, right? I tell people, Chris, you don't blow a high-pressure water line under your sink and scream for more mops. You first <laughs> stop the leak, then you get the mops out. Yeah. But the Democrats will tell you, well, no, no, no. We'll just go buy more mops. And I said, well, why don't we stop the water first? Then we'll argue about how many mops we need to get. Yeah. Well, have, have we done a better job here in terms of building the wall over during the course of the Trump well, administration? Well, I mean, you know, they, have we there's, materials the out there, there's materials out there in certain places that are not being utilized. There was additional border wall constructed during the Trump administration. But this is the thing I think that really is frustrating as a new a political neophyte out and run for a dog catcher. Mm. And now I'm running in the number one race on the board for the NRSC to get back control of the U S Senate. And you, you talk about this stuff and on the wall, um, Biden and the Democrats under his administration, I said, this happened under Trump, Obama and Bush that we authorized federal resources for the guard to surge, to support those three primitive agencies. Border Patrol, ICE, and Immigration Services. Obama spent zero dollars since January 20th on this effort. So if a Democrat you tells Biden. you, I mean Biden, yeah, uh, yeah. Obama, Biden, 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 Biden Obama, yeah. I mean. <laughs> Freudian slip. Um, the uh, it just depends how he wakes yeah. up in the morning. Who's yeah, pulling yeah. the strings? The if they tell you they're not for open borders, tell them actions speak louder than words. Sure. Actions speak louder than words. You have spent no money in nine months. And we have seen over a million people cross the border illegally that we've apprehended. That's separate than those we haven't. 
There are 7 million people in Arizona. Imagine absorbing. They haven't all come to Arizona, but just think about that on a scale of absorbing one-seventh of your population in nine months. Yeah. What would that do to your transportation, education, food, ice, water, health? How are you going to manage that? I'm a, I was a state emergency manager. How are you going to handle that? Yeah. That makes COVID look like no big problem. Well, I mean, there's another argument that m- most of this is being orchestrated and paid for. Well, the coyotes and the cartels have clearly uh, used this. You know, we were talking about fentanyl. I was in an event last night, and I said, we had a counter-drug task force in the Guard. Mm. We had never interdicted fentanyl as part of the support for our counter-narcotics guys prior to 2016. In the first quarter of this year, it was the number one thing that we assisted on for street value. Yeah. And people say, well, that's coming through at trucks and at the regular checkpoints. That doesn't have anything to do with a wall. I tell them, well, if people are out apprehending people crossing illegally at record numbers, what does that do to the people that are available at the, at the checkpoints for the trucks when you only have so many resources and the president won't authorize use of the guard there? just and comes right on through. It comes right on through. And, and where does fentanyl mostly come from? It, 90% of it's being produced in China. Exactly. And it's, it's moved across the U.S. through the corridors in southwest Arizona. They come up the west coast uh, of uh, Mexico, cross the open border, or in our, and if it's in a truck, cross it to checkpoint because there's literally hundreds of people crossing other places. So the agents are all doing that. And you're off to the races. Yeah. So, I mean, in terms of solutions, I mean, what sort of things, what sort of solutions would you try to pursue as a U.S. US senator? Well, you know, we, one can, of, we can talk about the problem. Your, one of your models is the, the free, uh, free enterprise, right? I yeah. tell people, they ask me about. We call I, them pillars. Uh, yeah, right. Yeah. Well, I talked uh, yesterday at an event. They asked me, about, well, what do you think about Trans-Pacific Partnerships? I said, I'll enter any free and fair trade agreement with anyone that's operating in a free and fair way. But China cheats, so there's no free trade with a cheater. I don't know any other way to put it. Pretty simple. And if you believe, and I know you're a smart man, you know this isn't true. If you believe that that 90% of the fentanyl that's coming into this country that's being produced in labs in China is happening without the consent of the Chinese Communist Party, you're not dealing in reality. Well, if you believe that, then you, you believe that, you know, the coronavirus was just a bat in a, right, in right. a piece, in some stew. Right, right. So, so they clearly are complicit so, in this. Yeah, of course. So the, and, and I tell people, you know. I, well, China, I mean, China, we can, we can start talking about this. China, there is an argument to be made that China is engaged in a cold war against mm-hmm. the United States. That has been happening for, for the better part of two decades. And it's, it, it took President Trump, to his credit, to s- say enough is enough. We need to confront this head on. And now this president is, is obviously tied to China in many ways, at both economically and personally. Mm-hmm. So there's, it's, it, and, and yet you don't see in the Senate this, this groundswell. To, and that's, that's the place where it would happen. Yeah, to it, confront it has China. to. And I, I would argue that tell the, the mother, tell the mother of a 14-year-old that overdoses and dies from a fentanyl overdose, that it's a cold war. Mm. Tell her it's a cold war. I mean, you know, Chris, when you and I were kids, um, experimental drug use didn't mean a one-way trip to a party yeah. here in Maricopa County. But for a 14-year-old today, that's what it can mean. And I tell people, put it in military parlance. In 2020, 90,000 Americans died. That's 120 infantry battalions. There's 750 soldiers in infantry battalion. Imagine losing 120 infantry battalions, say, in Afghanistan in 2020. What would the public, how would they respond to that? Yeah, there would be outrage. Right. But here, we know it's being produced in China, and it's just, uh, we keep making deals with them. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's, it's, it's a major issue that we're going to have to confront, and in and, and the Senate, it's the place to do it. Absolutely. And so that's, you know, that's an issue. That's an example of a federal issue. You know, the border is a federal issue. Uh, Our trade agreements internationally, federal issues. The idea of raising an army and maintaining a Navy, those are federal issues. You know, I tell people, 
Uh, Hamilton and Jefferson agreed on only two things. Greatest threat to the fledgling republic, a large standing army and oppressive taxation. I would argue we have arrived. <laughs> that, is, that, is the, that is the truth. And this, I mean, there's nothing, that's nothing to do with the idea that we don't have great soldiers, airmen, sailors, marine, coast guardsmen, space guardians in the force. It's that the, the framers of the Constitution knew that if you're spending right now 72 cents on the dollar in the Army on personnel costs, you're eventually going to break the bank. Yeah. Well, the military itself is under an incredible strain right now. If, if you look at the debacle in, in Afghanistan yeah. And, oh, yeah. and all the chiefs up on, on Capitol <laughs> Hill uh, this week trying to, trying to come up with some explanation as, as to what happened, but, but invariably throwing the president completely under the bus in terms of the timeline of events. Right. You know, what's your assessment on that? Well, I, I, watched, uh, I watched the testimony in the Senate. I didn't, wasn't able to see the House testimony, but I did watch that. I found it shocking <laughs> that two seated four stars and a retired four star now uh, Secretary of Defense said that this is the greatest strategic failing and foreign policy failure in their careers, I would argue, in the history of the country. I agree with that but that it was a logistical success. Now, I'm an F-16 pilot by trade, but if you came into me, Chris, as a guy as a, in a C-17 and said it was a great mission, sir, only seven people fell off the outside of the aircraft as we took off, I wouldn't quantify that as a logistical success. It was absolute chaos. It was the greatest failing of us giving up our freedom of movement that we had just 90 days ago turning into a complete debacle overnight. And I keep saying on these shows, Biden can delegate all of his authority, but none of his responsibility. The other piece that most stepped out of, uh, of the testimony to me that I found offensive hmm. was Senator Cotton asked um, General Milley, if you thought all this, why didn't you resign? And his response was the, those 13 service members at Abbey Gate couldn't resign. And I thought to myself, are you joking? When we see the scroll at the bottom of Fox News about a military commander, it always says we have lost confidence in this carrier battle group. I would say to General Milley, the American public has lost confidence in your ability to execute honestly and faithfully your duty to protect and defend the Constitution. I can't give you any reasonable explanation why I would go to Bob Woodward on the record and do a book in the middle of the chaos that's existed since January 8th to today. I have no idea what would motivate you to say, you know what, I got some time on my schedule. I'm going to go do dark beer, light money as the <laughs> chairman of the Joint Chiefs and talk about, you know, my calls to China back in October of 2020. Who does that? Yeah. Well, I mean, he has a lot of conflicts, obviously. <laughs> I just, I mean, you certainly can, you know, talk to your friends, talk to your spouse, to, but you're going on the record with a guy that you know is going to write a book. I mean, it wasn't a secret what he was talking to him about. Sure. I, I can't give you any good explanation why a professional military officer, most especially the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, who by statute is the ranking military officer in the country, would do that. He's not a commander, but he is the number one line number officer in the country. I don't get it. Yeah. What's your assessment about his conversation with China during that time? Uh, I believe it was inappropriate at best, illegal at worst, and that he needs to resign. There needs to be a hearing specific to that. The transcripts need to be unredacted and released publicly soon, and that... He threw uh, Mike Pompeo under the bus. Today, sure, I but too. I mean, if, said, if said Secretary Pompeo was in, in right, right, in but, complete, but completely aware, just release the doing. transcripts. Yeah, if it's not that big a deal, release the transcripts. Release it all. Give us the transcripts of what you told Woodward. Give us the transcripts of what you told all of these guys. And let's have a hearing about it in front of the U.S. Senate. So, if I were in the Senate, I would demand that as a fifty-first vote. People say, "Well, what are you going to do? You're being number one in hundred in seniority." Are you kidding me? If you're the 51st vote, ask Kirsten Cinema and, and Joe Manchin how interesting they are now all of a sudden. Seriously. Is there any other yeah. senators? Well, I mean, we've, we've said on this program that what's interesting about 
about those two is that there's about six or eight behind them who are sitting quietly in their offices clapping. Well, I mean, there may be, but I, I mean, mean, Uncle Joe Manchin, he's out there taking, you know, slings and arrows on behalf of, you know, a whole group of senators right. who, who don't want to go on the record, who don't want to be in the limelight on, on these issues, but who are probably in, in lockstep sure. with, with, you know, with, a, with both of them. Right. But if you're 51 and the road to 51 leads through Arizona and you don't control the White House, maybe all we'll do is have hearings. Yeah. Well, and the I hearings... tell the constituents that I go out and talk to everywhere. So what are you going to do? That's probably about it. Well, when you, I mean, going back to Afghanistan, when you look at what happened and you look how quickly it happened and you look at the giving up of uh, Bagram Air Force Base strategically, which was made absolutely no sense to anybody, even the layman. I'm not a military person. And, and when, when they made that decision, knowing what little I do know about, about the conflict in Afghanistan and where we had people and where, what we were trying to execute, I immediately said, well, this, this makes no sense. This is, yeah. this is our one strategic yeah. toehold uh, yeah. toe in, yeah. in the entire country. Why would we ever do this? And so just that one issue alone, giving up that, that, that base, why, if you disagreed with the president, why would you not put your stars on the table and just say, I, well, I cannot support this? That's a great question. You know, we talked about the January. I mean, all of them yeah. on the Hill the other yeah. day did not put their, their careers on the line and look the president straight in there and said, listen, if you go, if you go through with this, I'm not going to be supportive. Not right. only that. I'm out. my resignation. And that, that's right. But this is... At least th- it would have some honor. Think about what I, what I talked about. You follow legal, moral, ethical orders. If what you're asking me to do isn't legal, I don't judge the morality and efficacy. But if what you're asking me to do is legal, it is completely legal to turn over Bagram Air Base and the prisoner camp we had there back to the sovereign government of Afghanistan. Nothing illegal about that. But is it moral or ethical to do that if you know you're going to even leave one American citizen behind? What if it was your family member? Is that moral or ethical? And that's what I would challenge. That's my response would be, okay, you're right. It's totally legal. The president has it in his authority to issue and promulgate a legal order. But you as a military commander have to ask yourself, is it moral and ethical to leave them behind? If you know that this, this situation is decaying rapidly and collapse is imminent. It was just There's, strategically, just yeah, but seemed, but I'm, seemed, just to protect the citizens, yeah. it's not moral or ethical. So that's why you should have walked. I, I think there's there's a myriad of there were more questions left from that hearing than answers. Well, they only had five minutes to to, I know. to ask their questions, which was which was right. unbelievable right. to me. It, well, it just, there was more questions than answers as I left as I watched. And they're the having Senate. this one hearing than the than the hearing in the House, and that and that that that's not the end of the story. It can't no. be. No, and, and that's why I say... I mean, 13, 13 servicemen are dead. Exactly. and, and because, they, they, because, of their, because of their inaction. Right, and they, they multiple times said, we're accountable for this action. Well, okay, what's the accountability? Th- yeah. th- this is, you know, well, you, then, you talk sir, about it, you, it's time to go. Yeah. Right? They're, 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 someone has to be held to account. Now, unfortunately, the President of the United States has 350 million bosses, but they only get to say you're fired once every four years. But everybody else is at will. And again, I think Biden's derelict in his duty. He needs to make a change. Austin needs to go. Blinken needs to go. Mayorkas needs to go. Millie needs to go. They all need to go. Well, certainly if the domestic agenda over the next, I would say, 12 hours <laughs> completely collapses, there's going to be it's going to be an interesting time over the next several weeks and yeah. on, on on all on all these issues. The other thing that's happened in the military that's not getting a lot of attention, but it is j- probably just as important, is um, service members who are who are declining to take uh, yeah. the jab. Yeah. Uh, specifically, a lot of Navy SEALs mm-hmm. who are who are declining to be vaccinated. Most of them have had COVID. Mm-hmm. Vast majority of them, in fact, so they have natural immunity, and they're saying, "Listen, I I really don't want to do this," yeah. and 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 they're being forced to resign. And it's happening in a in a segment of the military that is our, probably our most valuable. You know, yeah, you know, I I guess our special forces as a as a commander that uh, worked through these processes. The the challenge that I see is the military has 
swept up medical readiness as the justification once the emergency authorization was lifted for the mandate. Now, there's some controversy, and I'm not a doctor to know which serial number and which Pfizer vaccine, Moderna. Many of the service members had Moderna still in an EUA, so any boosters or any of that would still be not legal. Having the president act with an executive order outside of that um, FDA approval process, I think is risky yeah. legally, and he would be sued. On the Pfizer thing, what I'm concerned about is um, the how we degrade readiness if all of these, at one point, only 43% of the military had voluntarily taken it. How are we going to fill 57% of all of the service members if they all are uh, discharged? There's no capability for us to generate that number of people sure. that quickly. And and I think about it also, I've thought more about the whole medical readiness piece. Uh, they're in a demographic that's not high risk for death. I understand the idea of loss of capability, but you know the things that we immunize for uh, in the past have been things that we know are very debilitating to their ability to continue to do the mission. Not saying that COVID for those high risk groups is a real, real problem. But yeah. the military, in my 14 months as this commanding general and uh, um, state emergency manager, managing the COVID response with 8,300 anecdotal small sample size. We only had one member of the 8,300 man and woman group get hospitalized for COVID. Mm -hmm. And he was, uh, I'm sure the vast civilian. majority of them, because they're very, some of the healthiest people right, on the right. planet didn't even know they had COVID. Right. But I mean, they just, we, we had one hospitalization out of 8,300 is, do you risk in the risk paradigm? Do sure. you risk the risk to readiness for people resigning over the idea that you may have one hospitalization in a group of 8,300? I just don't see it. Yeah, and, and I bring this up. There's so many different issues we can get into, but I bring this up because the military as an institution has traditionally been the, the most respected institution yeah. with it, within the government, within the federal government, and now it, it's under fire on all different sides, and it's just it, it's sad to say. It to is. See. I, I and, do, and, I and, do and, think that, you know, we talk about, you know, go all the way back to the beginning. Why would someone that, is in an organization that trades an 85% public trust, look to be a U.S. senator that trades in, right now, 9% public trust, if that's your stock price. No yeah. one makes that business transaction. And I keep telling you, were it not for, you know, Washington saying he couldn't be commanding general and commander-in-chief, and that this newly formed republic could not survive on the content of the character of the individuals, had to be based on this preeminent statute we built called the U.S. Constitution that we'd be compliant with, you wouldn't be where we are today. And that's, we have to continue to protect that. I keep telling people the Constitution doesn't always break your way, but you want members of the House and Senate, military officers, presidents, judges, governors that take these oaths of office to be first loyal to the Constitution, which is what? It's not a piece of paper. It's all those people wandering around on the streets, blind to their gender, their skin color, their religious preference. That's what you want. And you got to ask every voter, what do you want? At the end of the day, that's what you want the most because, as I said earlier, bad behavior begets more bad behavior and tyranny of the majority is far worse than tyranny of the individual. Tyranny of the majority is far worse than tyranny of the individual. And we're seeing that today. You bet. We're absolutely seeing the that The left today. is on the move. So when, when you were when you were directing, you mentioned just a, a second ago, the COVID response here in the state of Arizona. Yeah. I mean, anecdotally, or do you have any stories that, that you know, how would you assess our response? How would you assess? Oh, great, assess? great. I mean, we, we had the largest yeah. mobilization of guardsmen since 1942. I mean, versus other states. And, and oh, yeah, America. I think that uh, we, we in our agency focus not on health policy, but on delivering food, ice, water, and medical supplies and trying to maintain public confidence to mitigate any panic. Remember at the beginning, we were the first state that went into the food supply and sustainment logistics stuff because the military is great at big logistics. Sure. And I was most concerned about what happens if all the truck drivers are down. What happened? Because at that point, we didn't know exactly how people would react um, back in March, April, in terms of react to the disease. And so we wanted to make sure there was no big runs on the markets, no big runs on 
uh, our food and water. Uh, and, and that was key. That's all we focused on. We didn't get deeply involved in, you know, innovation. And th that was a, the hospitals take care of all that stuff. Our job was to provide support to the first responders to make sure they had everything they need. Unfortunately, I mean, a lot of the talk about the military mobilization during that time, especially the guard, was okay. They're, they're actually they're, they're being engaged to force the lockdowns to make sure that people are staying home. They're not, they're not really going to be mm -hmm. doing what they said they're going to be. How did you? That was out there. It was, yeah. And we we that was a real challenge. But remember, the very first missions we did were final mile logistics. Sure, we were taking stuff from the warehouse to the supermarkets. Now, one of the things I didn't know when we as state emergency manager, you learn this is every Circle K qualifies. And so you realize you got more supermarkets and you got 8,300 individuals. So we had to kind of prioritize the major outlets based on demographics to make sure that we were helping them where they needed help. And then, you know, once we got that going, it immediately pivoted where everybody was again, thanking people for their service and giving them a hug and Glad to see him out there. Yeah. Well, it's, it certainly was a, a, a massive undertaking yeah. during a time when there was a lot of fear and uncertainty. Yeah, it was. Like I said, it was the greatest state, still is the greatest state in the Republic to be the emergency manager for, for yeah. sure. Uh, but uh, everything changed. You know, we know hurricanes, no earthquakes. Just, I was pretty quiet duty until. That is one of the great things about living in Arizona. <laughs> But, you know, April, this April 2020 cha or changed all that. So, yeah, that, that, that's for sure. So looking at the campaign going forward, like what are some of the things keeping you up at night? What are some of the things? How are you assessing your your um, your competition and how would you assess like your your eventual competition and in, in Senator Mark Kelly? Well, he's I, been he, he's been said, very quiet. He's been very quiet. Yeah, and in fact, if you we mentioned this on the show last week, I mean, if you go back and you look at the tweets of certain Democrats within the state, going back to the you know the the crisis in Afghanistan, there were no tweets about that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There were there was nothing going on, no right. criticism, right? Uh, nothing nothing directed the president or our military about what should or should not be done from anybody from his party, right. which I thought thought was disingenuous and and, and showed a poor lack of, sure. of leadership. And, so, and he's been quiet overall on on everything, including this three point five trillion dollar, yeah. um, you know, wish list, and uh, the the uh, the infrastructure bill, the, the raising right. of the debt. How's he going to vote on that? He hasn't really, yeah, and been here's, engaged. Here's what I would say: uh, You ask about how I assess the race. Um, I was asked by a reporter at CNN, you're up against two self-funders in the primary and a guy that's been elected statewide as the attorney general, what's your advantage? I said, the question answers itself. He said, what? I said, we've never elected a self-funder statewide to the U.S. Senate in our over 100-year history. And if there was such an appetite for previously elected officials, why have three of the four of us never run for dog catcher? So... I'm the only candidate that's never run for office and is not a self-funder and that needs to build an army in these rural counties and then surge into the urban counties to build that army of two million voters. What's it going to take? It's going to take a lot of people being willing to contribute whatever they can to this campaign. Uh, I, I tell people Bernie Sanders was a brilliant, brilliant politician in terms of being able to go down to the Nogales border and tell them all to give him 27 bucks and 400 people did it. Yeah. Right. And you can build a, an army with with small donors. So that's it's kind of my focus. But I'm working across the spectrum. But as, it, as you look at the bigger picture with Kelly, uh, he's not an Arizona independent. He lied to you, Chris. He's voted 98 percent of the time, over 60 times with Chuck Schumer. Uh, he he said he was going to be an Arizona independent. And people say, well, what's wrong with him? He hasn't once represented our interests. He said, we're going to study the border. I'll tell him what's happening at the border. He said that he hasn't said a word about breaking the bank on an infrastructure bill that has no infrastructure in it. Um, he's been completely derelict in his duty on his questioning of the members as a, as a member of the Armed Services Committee this week. He essentially asked McKenzie, didn't ask Millie or Austin a single question, three questions that he all knew the answer were going to be classified and into being a closed session. 
and then gave him a hug and said, thanks for being here. Yeah. I thought, I thought it was a complete dereliction. Right. So, as, so, as, so as, as, I'm laser focused on raising an army of 2 million voters and we're going to put the, the commanding general of the largest mobilization since 1942 up against the astronaut. And I tell people, he, now he, you've had some history with Mark. Yeah. And Bezos is, you know, he needs somebody to fly him out to space. So <laughs> you don't have to worry about him being unemployed. Um, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I don't have any direct history with him as much as his, I, Gabby Giffords is long time Tucsonan and knew my sister-in-law this is a small, small world. Yeah. We all grew up together. And, that's right. And, uh, she's great and was a great supporter and I have nothing negative to say about her, but Mr. Kelly's got to stand on his record now. Yeah. He's yeah, got to stand on let's his record. Let's make that absolutely clear. There's he's Gabby stand, Giffords, who's yeah, he's a dear got, friend. And, yeah, he's got to stand on his record. And her husband needs needs to not be Gabby Giffords' right, husband. Yeah. It needs to be Mark Kelly. Yeah, Mark senator. Kelly's a U.S. senator now. And he's now he, got to stand on his record. Exactly. Exactly. Um, well, thank you so much for coming on. We really appreciate your thank time. You. And, and best of luck on the campaign. And uh, thank you for your service. Thank you for yeah. everything you've done for our state. And well, for our you're welcome. Thanks for having me. And uh, and love to have you back on when you have a chance. I'd love to be on again. Yeah. And see all your friends, all the people that are unavoidably detained. <laughs> <laughs> and and thank you all for listening. And again, you can find us on all the big platforms. And yep, remember thank this you. this podcast about faith, freedom, and free enterprise, which are the founding principles of this great country. God bless. Thank you. Bless you.